You may not guess this from my relaxed exterior, but I was raised very religious. And um, by religious, I mean Southern Baptist. And uh, growing up in central northern Maine, up in New England, near Canada, that may seem like a contradiction, but uh, we were definitely south of something, like Montreal or, or whatever. And um, I took it very seriously. Um, I say I was raised religious, but the truth is I was almost, in a way, born religious. Um, if there is a religiosity gene, I probably have it. Uh, I was just, I was very serious about going to church, about praying, about um, evangelizing at a certain point. Even as a young kid, I thought about being a preacher. Didn't work out, obviously. Uh, <laughs> unless you count this as a sermon, which it isn't. Um, and, but as I got older, I started to feel uh, my faith being kind of shot through by doubt. I started to experience just questions that I couldn't answer, like the fact that there are so many religions in the world, uh, you know, why should I be so certain that mine was correct? And also the idea of free will and evil really bugged me. I had this idea that, you know, God created us and he's responsible for the way we are, so isn't it hypocritical of him to, uh, to blame us when we screw up, right? It's like he, he started it. Uh, there's this line in Dostoevsky, uh, the Brothers Kar Karamazov, where uh, one character says, he created us sick, created us sick, and then ordered us to be healthy. And it was, it was feelings like this when I was a kid that led me to experience doubt. But I was very earnest, and I wanted to believe. So from time to time, like, a, um, like somebody going on a diet, I would become very into church. I would just be like, okay, to, this Tuesday I'm going to pray really hard or whatever. And I, I had this experience of really trying to, to save my faith, to revitalize my faith as I got older. And what I'd like to tell you about today was probably the most extreme version of that, which was when I was in college. I went to college at the University of New Hampshire up in Durham. And it's a beautiful uh, school. And they had this thing called InterVarsity, which was like a multi-denominational kind of loose Christian fellowship. And they were doing this thing in 2009 uh, where for your spring break you could volunteer to go down to New Orleans and uh, help people to recover, to rebuild after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. And I thought this was really cool. I was like, okay, this is my, this is my big chance, right? I'm going to believe again. Um, so I signed up, I took the, the spring break, and I took this 25-hour bus ride uh, down to New Orleans, and I spent the week there. And it was kind of cool. We did some good work. None of us knew how to build a house, so we were pretty much useless. But we, you know, I could at least haul around dirt and, uh, you know, nail nails. And I was probably about as useful there as I am as a cameraman here. So whatever, it's fine. Um, <laughs> I had a good time during the day, but at night, I would go back to the church where we were all staying. And I felt like everybody was confident in their faith. They believed. They really believed. They seemed to believe. And I just didn't. The whole week I felt like it was, um, actually looking back on it, I know exactly what to compare it to. It felt like when you've had a great relationship that isn't great anymore, you know, and it's, it's ending. And, uh, you know, you get that long, slow, miserable death where you're like, everything's fine, it's wonderful, and, you know, but I'm just going to, there's an issue over here, but I'll solve it, I'll fix it, I'll make a, w we'll find a way to make this work. Right, and that was the sensation that I had. It was like, do you know what I mean? Have you been there? It's like that, f that feeling in your stomach. Um, and anyway, so I came away from this week, you know, going on to the bus ride home, again, 25 hours, uh, just thinking about this and feeling kind of alone in my doubts. And it was on this bus ride home that something really strange and extraordinary happened. And again, I have to stress to you, every word of this is true. Um, and I won't say the bus company name, but let's just say it's, we'll just call it Silver Dog. Okay, so the company's organizational anonymity is totally secure. You know, don't worry about it. Silver Dog, totally Silver Dog, don't see me. Um, and uh, so we're driving home. We're about five, ten hours in on this 25-hour bus ride, and suddenly the bus goes like that. It tilts really suddenly, and it's, it's terrifying. Um, and the bus driver handled it like a champ. Uh, we were in the center lane on a highway going probably 65 or 70. Um, so we couldn't immediately pull over into the breakdown lane. So maybe about 10, 20 seconds were passing. A long, long 20 seconds where we're just, no, nothing feels right, you know. And we get over to the right lane and then into the breakdown lane. 
and we're sort of parked, we're calming down, and the bus driver gets on the intercom and says, uh, we've just hit a really deep pothole. And uh, our, I think our, it was a, the front right tire is completely flat. Uh, so we're going to call another bus, but don't worry, you know, we'll take care of it. Um, everybody, please just, in a leisurely fashion, get off the vehicle. And so we're like, okay, crisis averted, right? And um, so we're kind of moseying off, and then the bus driver gets back on the intercom, and this time her tone is completely different. She says, everybody off the bus, now there's a fire. And when somebody says fire in that tone where you're like, okay, this is not a joke, it is not a drill, uh, you, you fucking run, right? <laughs> so, we, so we were like, okay, we didn't grab anything. Okay, keep in mind, we don't have our, you know, no stuff on us. And this was slightly pre-cell phones. We didn't really have cell phones, a lot of us, most of us. Again, 2009 or so. So, so we run off the bus and sure enough, that tire, that tire wheel area is on fire. And, and t looking back, what had happened was the rim had made contact with the highway. And during that 20 seconds or so, it had caught fire. So they called the fire department, called 911, and the fire truck pulled up and they started to, to hose it down and we're a safe distance away and we're just kind of watching this happen. And at a certain point, the uh, firefighter says, we think that the fire has spread below the truck, below the, uh, below the bus, and we're not sure we can get to it. Uh, so we need everybody to stand very far back and watch out. And sure enough, over time, uh, not that much time, uh, the fire spread beneath the bus and hit an almost full gas tank. Now, when I tell you this thing exploded, I mean exploded. It was like an action movie. I mean, it felt, looked, and sounded exactly like you imagine an action movie to be. Um, it was terrifying. And I remember, um, you know, as I watched the fire, it was like a fucking mushroom cloud going up into the sky. I had this feeling of relief because I was looking at it and I, I imagined that my faith was going up into the sky. And it, maybe it sounds strange to call this relief, but I did. I felt relieved. Um, and I was like, I don't, I'm never doing this again. I'm letting it go. You know, it's, it's not worth it. And there's a coda to this story. And just a brief aside, but I, it, I thought it was worth mentioning. This uh, silver dog uh, company uh, saw fit to take us to a hotel afterwards where we met with this very professional woman dressed in a suit from the silver dog company who um, was standing very stern in front of a table on which was placed a blank piece of paper like straight from a printer and a pen. And she goes, hello everybody. My job is to assess what happened here today. So I'm gonna need you to write down your name and your contact information, and an estimate of the value of the property you lost. Now, I witnessed 100 pious, beautiful, righteous young Christians line up in an orderly fashion. I mean, they were so organized. And one by one commit insurance fraud. They were all like, Oh yeah, I had like a $3,000 camera in there. The backpack alone was 500, you know? 7,000, easy, no problem. And I swear to God, I was halfway through the line and I saw the insurance agent and she smirks and she winks at me. Thanks very much. <laughs>